if any words that I have spoken have commanded attention, that is only because they find an echo in the breasts of those of every land and of every race who love freedom and are the foes of tyranny. Well, Park, when statesmen like Winston Churchill talk, nations listen. What kind of a people do they think we are? Is it possible they do not realize that we shall never cease to persevere against them until they have been taught a lesson which they and the world will never forget? At the end of May 1916, both the British and Germans planned to send a large battle group to a position roughly 80 miles west of the northern tip of Denmark. They each planned a trap for the other. With early but hazy intelligence on the German sortie, the British left harbour first. The British Grand Fleet coming from its northern bases at Scarpa Flow and Cromarty, the battle cruisers joining from Rosyth further south. It was a huge force silently sailing into the night. The British were on a direct collision course with Hipper's scouting group of five battle cruisers. They were steaming roughly 60 miles ahead of Scheer and the main battle fleet. Only chance brought the two battle cruiser groups together. A small Danish steamer, the NJ Fjord, was seen by each other's scouts. Simultaneously, they went to investigate and in doing so, fell upon each other, firing what would become the opening shots of the Battle of Jutland. Beatty ships were faster, they could shoot further and use heavier shell. In his mind, he could easily deal with Hipper's five battle cruisers. Beatty was a fox hunting man and loved the chase. He showed extraordinary courage under fire. But Jellicoe was always concerned with one thing, that Beatty would too easily be pulled into such a trap. Beatty immediately raced south, wanting to cut Hipper off from his route home. But in his haste to close with his adversary, he may have made a mistake. He left behind four of the most modern and powerful ships on the sea that day, Rear Admiral Hugh Evan Thomas's four 15-inch gunned Queen Elizabeth-class battleships. A question that was asked, even by many battlecruiser officers, was why Beatty had not opened fire earlier. He had the range advantage, and Hipper had always feared the period when his ships would be in a danger zone, unable to return effective fire, but being hit by British fire. 3.48 on the afternoon of May 31st, Hipper gave the order, open fire. His flagship, the Lutzau, the guns roared. Within three salvos, deadly German fire was straddling the British ships, and within three minutes, line had been hit twice. Initial British fire badly overshot the German line, maybe because of the bad visibility. British fire allocation had also been badly muddled. Beatty had intended that Lutzau should be targeted by both the Lion and Princess Royal, and that worked. But the Tiger and Queen Mary mistakenly targeted one ship too far back. The second German ship in the line, the Dörflinger, was left totally untargeted. But it was the firing from the Von der Tann that scored the first victory. Her gunnery officer, Marholz, managed to score repeated hits, though he said he could hardly make up the target as she was almost totally covered in splash. After only 13 minutes of battle, the first British ship, the Indefatigable, slid out of line, rolled over and sank. Any survivors didn't last long in the numbingly cold waters of the North Sea. Two men, later rescued by the Germans, tried in vain to rescue their captain. 25 minutes later, the Queen Mary also fell victim to German guns. She'd only been in service three years. The pride of the Royal Navy disappeared in a devastating explosion. A huge mushroom cloud, the only visible evidence that a ship had ever even been there. In less than half an hour, more than 2,000 British sailors lost their lives. In total, there were only 23 survivors from the two catastrophic magazine explosions and only 18 of them from the Queen Mary. The battlecruiser's architect, British Admiral Sir Jackie Fisher, thought the ship's higher speed and greater gunnery range would more than compensate for the relatively light armour protection. At Jutland, they were proved wrong, and the results were fatal. Getting the explosive cordite charges from a turret magazine to the guns was exhausting. 
and under fire, brutally so. The gunners wanted the cordite shell as fast as possible so they could shoot more quickly. Consequently, cordite bags were dangerously stockpiled around the insides of turrets and passages, and this made the flash-tight doors designed to stop the flames travelling between the turrets and the magazines irrelevant. Two minutes after the Queen Mary had gone, Lyon nearly suffered the same fate. A half hour earlier, her Q turret had been hit and the top had been blown off. A huge tower of flame now shot skyward. Had the turret still been covered, she would have also blown up. Scouting ahead of the battle cruisers, Goodenough on the Southampton urgently signalled that 16 German dreadnoughts were in sight and closing fast. The British now realised they were heading into a trap. Waiting a few moments to confirm the news, Beatty turned his four remaining battlecruisers around, but the four accompanying Queen Elizabeths continued southbound into increasingly heavy German fire. Using the same spot around which to turn his ships and reverse course was a mistake. Evan Thomas only made it easier for the German gunners. All they needed to do was to keep their guns trained on the very same spot as the British obligingly steamed into the cauldron of fire. Beatty's ships had been hit badly, after 75 minutes by around 44 heavy calibre shells, and the Germans less than half that amount. After the Queen Mary exploded, BT came to an awful conclusion. He turned to his flag captain, Ernie Chatfield, and muttered, there seems to be something wrong with our bloody ships today. Now it was Beatty's fortunes that rose, as the four Queen Elizabeths began to move north, shielding his rear. Pressure on his own four ships was relieved, but damage to the battleships was extensive, even if they dealt out equal punishment. But the British trap nearly wasn't ready at all. Jellico only had the roughest idea of the position and course of the two German forces. His repeated and increasingly exasperated requests for information were all but ignored by Beatty, who was busy fighting his own battle. Five minutes before six, the ships of the Grand Fleet and the battlecruiser fleets were finally able to make each other out in the hazy mist. But crucially, Jellicoe himself still could not see any German ships. The British commander-in-chief literally only had minutes in which to decide how to best meet the invisible threat. The timing was critical to avoid his own fleet being caught in the middle of the manoeuvre when most of his firepower could not be brought to bear. Jellicoe deployed the Grand Fleet to port, towards the Danish coastline. The fleet literally remodelled itself from six parallel lines, each with four dreadnoughts, into one continuous line five and a half miles long, designed to hurl the maximum amount of steel against the enemy. The manoeuvre was brilliant. It blocked Shear within a semicircle of British guns. And turning so many ships in such little space required extraordinary seamanship. There were close calls, but not one collision amongst the 122 ships' captains. First the British fleet steered towards Denmark, then turned south to parallel the coast. It might have seemed as though Jellicoe was steaming away from the German fleet, but in fact he was positioning his own fleet more carefully. As Beatty took the Lion ahead of the Grand Fleet so that he could position his own battle cruisers in the van, Admiral Arbuthnot crossed dangerously close, only getting two of his four ships through Beatty's own line. The defence and warrior headed straight towards the Germans, intent on attacking the cruiser Wiesbaden. Instead, the defence was met with a hail of fire. It exploded in a fireball and sank with all hands. The German ships were now silhouetted against the western setting sun, while Jellicoe's own were almost invisible, lost in a grey murk. The German fleet's direct route home had been cut off by the Grand Fleet, putting themselves in between their opponents and their harbour. The Germans had become increasingly boxed in, first by Beatty in the west, then Jellicoe to the north, and now a new force, Horace Hood's 3rd Battle Cruiser Squadron to the east. Things started well for Hood. The Invincible went to the rescue of the Chester, where the young, wounded Jack Cornwall continued to man his post on her forward gun. A few days later, he would die of his wounds. Posthumously, he would receive the Victoria Cross for his bravery. Invincible shooting found its mark, mortally damaging one of her aggressors, the Wiesbaden. There was only to be one survivor, the stoker Hugo Zenner, and among the dead was Gorg Falk, the much-beloved German poet. Then at 6.30, another huge explosion. Invincible had blown up. All her crew, except six, had gone down with her. And all that was left this time were just the two halves, stern and bar, sticking upright out of the shallow waters. At first, the British sailors cheered, they thought it was a German wreck, and then they saw her name. 
60 meters below, Invincible's aft gun can still be seen, pointing majestically out beneath the cold grey waters of the North Sea. Hipper's ships were out in front of the main battle fleet's dreadnoughts, strung out in a line that was nine miles long. His leading ships were coming under a terrible and increasing rain of British shells. The range was short, around 10,000 yards, and British shooting was superb. 23 heavy hits in minutes. Jellicoe's own flagship, the Iron Duke, hit the Koenig seven times in as many minutes. Although, to give you an idea of just how bad the visibility was, Iron Duke's gunnery officer was even nervous at this point about opening fire. He wasn't sure if the ship he saw was an enemy or a friend. Shear was stunned, but only for a moment. He quickly recovered and ordered a complete turnabout of his battle fleet. Within four minutes, his ships, now steaming away from Jellicoe, vanished into the mist. Jellicoe was left totally in the dark. None of the captains who'd seen what happened reported anything back to him. The Royal Navy had become victim to its own traditions. Speak only when spoken to, do something only when ordered. This navy was not an easy place for officers with initiative. The British Admiral decided against following Cher into the mist. He doubted he would catch him. But more important, he was also convinced, some say obsessed, that his ships would steam onto mines laid by the German ships in their wake. In fact, his belief that all German destroyers carried mines was wrong, but his intentions had been laid out and agreed to by the Admiralty two years before the battle. Then Scheer surprised Jellicoe a second time. He reversed the previous turn to relaunch another attack of the British line. It seemed like madness. Under intense fire, the front of the German line again buckled, bunching up so badly this time that before Scheer even ordered another turn, the leading ship started to turn independently, so desperate were they to get out from under British fire. Out in front, Hipper's battle cruisers were now in tatters. Only one option seemed open to Scheer, to get his main battle fleet home as fast as possible, and certainly before daylight, and what would undoubtedly be his fleet's annihilation. He now ordered waves of torpedo attacks, and with the command, ran and find a charge of the heavily damaged battle cruisers at the British line, no matter what the cost. It was Scheer's only way to cover the escape of the main battle fleet. Scheer knew his opponent and correctly anticipated Jellicoe's next move, the threat was enough for the British Admiral to turn the Grand Fleet away from the swarm of oncoming German torpedoes to try to outrun them. Turning towards the torpedoes would have been exceptionally dangerous. The closing speed alone would have been around 45 miles an hour rather than 5, and the time taken for the complete turn might just have been too long. Not one single one of the 31 torpedoes that eventually reached the British line hit a British ship, though there were many close calls. Jellico was, as he knew he would be, widely criticised by much of the press and by the British public and by many of those in the Admiralty who specifically had approved of his intended actions two years earlier, including Churchill, even by Beatty privately. But as Beatty later wrote when he himself was C&C of the British fleet, when you're winning, risk nothing. While Jellicoe only had an inkling where the German fleet was, Beatty signalled that his battle cruisers should take over the lead. At that point, the nearest German ship was probably nine miles distant. Jellicoe nevertheless followed Beatty's suggestion, ordering Jerem to support him. But Jerem had no idea where Beatty was. Between the two lines of adversary ships, however, were two light cruisers, the Caroline and the Royalist. They could in fact see the Germans, and they promptly engaged. Unluckily, Caroline's torpedo, aimed at the battleship Westphalen, went right underneath her. British torpedoes were, in fact, notoriously unreliable. The two light cruisers then requested help, but were turned down. Rear Admiral Jerome was not persuaded that the targets weren't, in fact, beaties. Jerome's actions lost the British 15 minutes of continued action in daylight, and that might not have been decisive in itself, but it might also have very easily cost Cher another ship or two so heavily damaged were they by now. At nightfall, both fleets reorganised. Jellico wanted to actually avoid a night action. It left too much to chance. Dreadnoughts, in his mind, were far too vulnerable to short-range torpedo attacks, and German night fighting equipment and experience actually superior to that of the Royal Navy in some critical areas. The smaller guns, the secondary armament on German ships, were directly trained by searchlights that could, one moment, send out a 
powerful pinpoint light operating with an iris-like shutter and then just as fast completely open up to full illumination for full main battery fire. British searchlights by comparison were extremely crude. The British didn't even have star shells, which the Germans did. At this point there was only one thing that was really on Scheer's mind, to break through the British Lion and to take his ships to safety, and he had three routes to choose from. But to get through, he had first to break through the protective screen of the 58 destroyers that Jellicoe had placed five miles behind the Grand Fleet, and Scheer knew about these destroyers from intercepted messages. At 10pm, Scheer decided to take the shortest route. He headed southeast for the Horns Reef. Throughout the day, some of the Admiralty signals were quite misleading, making Jellicoe doubtful of subsequent intelligence, starting with the now infamous message stating that Scheer's flagship was still in harbour, and before five o'clock, that illusion had been shattered. Distrustful of the intelligence he was getting, Jellicoe made up his own mind. He headed direct south to the Jade. What was worse was that none of the signal intercepts had been decrypted by Room 40, revealing the true destination of the German high seas fleet were passed on. Jellicoe was furious when he found out after the war's end. During the next few hours, there would be seven separate, unequal, but bitterly fought engagements between small British destroyer flotillas and German battleships and their escorts. In one, the British fourth flotilla lost a full 70% of her ships. One of her destroyers, the 935-tonne Spitfire, physically clashing bow to bow with the 20,000-tonne dreadnought, the Nassau. In another engagement, the Rhineland physically sliced a British destroyer in two. But the British were also able to claim some successes in the night action. A torpedo shot from the British destroyer Onsort claimed the pre-dreadnought, the SMS Pollmann. A secondary armaments magazine caught fire and she exploded in front of the German line with more than 800 deaths. Not one single report of the many flotillas' actions reached the Iron Duke that night. While German Telefunken signals certainly blocked some of the radio reports, most captains did not understand the value of sending back information to the flagship. Eventually the Germans did succeed in punching through the British line, and Jellicoe had no idea that they'd even done so. Despite the many opportunities, the British failed to sink the massively damaged Seidlitz, and the Germans themselves were responsible for scuttling the Lutzau. Seidlitz would not rejoin the fleet until mid-September, Derflinger not until the next month. Jellica was ready four hours after reaching Scarpa, and Tiger, Princess Royal, Barham and Malaya were repaired by July, while each of five German battleships needed 50 days of repairs in dock. On the basis of sinking more ships, and because more British sailors died in the battle, the Germans claimed victory. The Kaiser, welcoming the fleet back on the 1st of June, declared that the spirit of Trafalgar and British sea power had finally been destroyed. But to claim any victory, one needs to have achieved one's stated objectives, and the German intentions of ending the British blockade or seriously damaging the Grand Fleet had clearly failed. And although one might say that the German high seas fleet fought with great courage and inflicted heavy pain on the Royal Navy, it was not able to again successfully challenge the British and finish what had been started at Jutland. British sea dominance remained intact and it seemed as if nothing had in fact changed. Except everything. A Pandora's box had in fact been opened by the very success of holding the German fleet at bay. In a secret report to the Kaiser days after the battle, Admiral Scheer wrote that Germany could never win the war by defeating the British fleet at sea. They had to try to defeat Britain economically by cutting the vital supply of materials and food that came to her by sea. That meant that Germany could only hope to win the war by gambling on an aggressive campaign of unrestricted submarine warfare. Throughout the year, Scheer and the Naval Chief of Staff, Henning von Holzendorf, tried to persuade the Cabinet and the Kaiser to change tactics, unsuccessfully. At the end of 1916, on November the 29th, Jellicoe handed over the command of the Grand Fleet to Vice Admiral Sir David Beatty. Jellicoe accepted the appointment to the position of First Sea Lord to breathe new life into the Admiralty and to find a solution to the growing U-boat threat. And as the Navy's new operational head, he had to find the answers quickly. On February the 1st, 1917, the savage new submarine war started. 
The Germans calculated that Britain would be on her knees in five months. The country nearly was. In April, over 600,000 tons of British shipping was sunk, much of it off the East Coast. And if one counts the total of Allied shipping sunk or damaged, it was almost 1 million tons. Given that Britain's entire merchant marine totaled 11.5 million tons, one can well understand Jellicoe's rising pessimism. The British may have retained surface control of the seas after Jutland, but they very nearly lost the submarine battle in the first half of the following year. By the end of 1917, the tools with which to win the anti-submarine war had been put in place by Jellicoe. The most controversial change was probably the adoption of convoy itself, which had been wrongly accused of having been against. He was not. But he could only move forward once America was in the war, which happened on April the 6th. It allowed the crucial transatlantic convoys to assemble in what had previously been neutral waters and also gave the British the vital key to convoy success, destroyers. The first seven arrived on May the 4th and by July there were 34 in British waters. There were a mass of other improvements. Firstly, new mines, actually in this case copied from the Germans. Secondly, the birth of directional hydrophones that was to later become the basis for British Aztec sonar. Third, howitzer launched bombs that also became the basis of the very successful British destroyer Hedgehog depth charge system in the Second World War. Fourth, a longer endurance aeroplane search system capability with the American Curtis H-12. And finally, a massive increase of civilian patrol boats and whalers, disguised but armed merchantmen and faster patrol boats. But the list goes on. The new tools started to impact. By December 1917, monthly tonnage losses of merchant shipping fell to 300,000 tonnes, and by March 1918, total losses were down to 200,000. The Germans had calculated that the US would enter the war once unrestricted submarine war was unleashed on neutral ships, but they also thought they could defeat Britain before their help would arrive. They were wrong. Less than one month after America declared war on April the 6th, the first American destroyers, so desperately needed for the effective running of the convoy system itself, arrived in Queenstown. Helping turn the tide back in favor of the Allies did not save Jellicoe from the political acts of David Lloyd George, the Prime Minister. He was about to finally leave the Admiralty and get back to his wife and children for Christmas when a curt letter from Sir Eric Geddes, his direct political boss, arrived. It was just moments after officers from his old flagship, the Iron Duke, had presented him with a silver model of his old ship. In Germany, the effects of the continued blockade had deep consequences. It stirred revolution. Civilians suffered terrible food shortages in the winter of 1916, and the time was known as the Turnip Winter. And there was little let up as the Allied squeeze on commerce tightened. Divisions in the German fleet, now rusting away in the harbour, ran deep. Morale collapsed and revolutionary unrest grew. The intense but very often acrimonious debate that followed Jutland had one great benefit for the Royal Navy. It led to a period of steady and profound modernisation, helping prepare the Navy for the next war. In 1928, Jellicoe invited Reinhard Scher who was now a widower after the murder of his wife to come and stay with him at his home on the Isle of Wight. Sadly, the meeting never came to pass, but it does intrigue me to think of what the discussions would have been had the two old adversaries met. When Jellico died in 1935, the flags of three navies, the Royal Navy and both the French and German navies were lowered. It was a recognition both from the Allies for his efforts, but also from former adversaries honoring him. Two months after Jellicoe died, the younger Beatty followed. The strain of command had equally taken its toll on his old Jutland comrade-in-arms. The two Jutland admirals now lie together in the shadow of Nelson in St Paul's Cathedral. And on Trafalgar Square, their bus gaze across the fountains dedicated to their victory 100 years ago towards Nelson. <laughs>